and I believe we are live. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I hope you're returning, and if not, where have you been? Uh, this is the Whiskey Makes Me Happy Hour. My name is Mark Pendlebury from Whiskey Brother, coming to you live from Johannesburg, South Africa, and uh, really good to be back, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, I hope wherever you're watching from that you're safe and sound, uh, that you and your family and friends are keeping well under the current circumstances, uh, and hopefully this is just a nice distraction from the world out there and from reality, and a good excuse to share a whiskey online. Um, for many of us, this is what we love, right? Whiskey is our passion. Uh, that goes for myself and the Whiskey Brother team as well, of course, and so uh, it feels a little bit normal just to have a whiskey, uh, talk about whiskey. And thankfully, we've had some great guests choose to join us um, and uh, and just kind of hopefully share some knowledge with, uh, with the community out there. So thank you very much. Depending on where you're coming in from, uh, just maybe in the, in, the, in the chat window, just let us know. Uh, it's really nice to see, first of all, where you're from, uh, where you're watching from, and again, um, where, uh, what's in your glass. So um, this is in my glass this afternoon for obvious reason. We'll talk a little bit more about this. But... Um, yeah, just before we get started, just want a, a quick update about Whiskey Brother. So at the moment, although South Africa has has moved from level five to level four, all alcohol sales are still prohibited. So uh, on a somber note, uh, Whiskey Brother is still closed for business at this point in time. Um, unfortunately, the bar can't operate, our retail store can't operate, and online, although you can order, and if you do, it's a great help to us, but we can only deliver after the lockdown. Uh, it looks as if from level three, uh, we can start doing a little bit of retail, very limited to certain hours of the day. Um, we don't know when that will be. As soon as we know, as soon as we have any uh, news to share, just look out for online and our newsletter on our website, and we'll let people know. Obviously, myself and my team are very eager to get back to work, um, very eager to do what we love, to do what we do, and to do what feeds us, uh, and, uh, and get whiskey kind of out there to the masses. Um, on that note as well, so um, the Only Whiskey Show, which is our whiskey festival that happens annually, at this point in time, it's really hard to know when that show would be able to go ahead. Uh, I think what has become clear is that the, the, the planned dates, which would have been on the 30th and the 31st of July uh, in Joburg, then for the first time ever, we were also going to take the show down to Cape Town. That was going to be on the 6th and 7th of August. I think it's clear that those dates will not be an option or will prob the probability uh, will be that the, those dates will not be an option. So uh, although I expect and hope by then lockdown is all done, uh, it is quite a large event with you know five, 550 people in, in one big room at the same time. Uh, and so I think the suspicion is based on kind of you know global trends that events of that size will most likely not be able to go ahead. Um, the intention for us is not to cancel the show this year, but just to postpone the show. So uh, hopefully by October, September or September, October, later in the year, we can get the show up and running again. Um, for now, just watch the space. Uh, we have to make sure that, you know, all the, all the brands and the exhibitors can get there. We actually had special guests book that we were going to bring in. We've unfortunately been in contact with them to say, uh, you know, it's not going to happen right now. Obviously everyone's very understanding and not, it doesn't come as a surprise to many, but it is very unfortunate. It's going to be an exciting show, um, and uh, just watch the space. Again, not cancelled, hopefully just postponed. We'll let you know as soon as uh, we can go ahead with those plans. Um, for the sake of this there, if you have any questions uh, for Adam, our special guest today, um, please just drop them in the questions section. Depending on, on time, I will definitely ask uh, Adam your questions. If you see someone else's question that you like, just give it an upvote. Uh, unfortunately, time is always limited, and um, uh, I'm sure Adam has some whiskey to make or his family to get back to, but uh, I'll, I'll ask him the top question. So if you see a question you like, just give it an upvote. There's something there that you'd like to know that isn't there, just enter that, and then I'll definitely try and address those with Adam. If there's anything about whiskey in general or not specific to Adam and Brooke Laddie, then um, ask those as well, and after my conversation with Adam, I'll hang around for a little bit longer and answer any of those questions. Uh, I also just have a, a brief poll this, this this week. It's not really a poll, but it's a question of my own. We're definitely going to keep these going. Uh, at this point in time, we don't know really what the South African lockdown looks like in the weeks to come. But uh, I've already said this. Our intention will be to keep these going, maybe not as regularly. Uh, it's hard to think we're actually now <clears throat> on our fifth episode. Um, but uh, we will keep these going. Uh, we just like to know what day of the week suits everyone. At the moment, most people are home. So, you know, whether it's maybe a Monday, Tuesday, it's not 
it doesn't make too much of a difference going forward in a scenario where hopefully we're all back at work and things are moving again we just like to know what day would suit you best and we'll try and accommodate the masses uh, so just before I bring Adam online, our very special guest was this this week. Uh, I thought it'd just be you know be worthwhile giving a bit of an introduction um, and a bit of context to both the distillery as well as Adam himself, a bit of the background, a bit of history. So Brogladi is an incredible distillery, and I think you know I would you know, anyone who 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 kind of frequents Whiskey Brother and knows us, knows the bar, knows the shop, knows the show, will know Brogladi. Um, so Brogladi very much. You know, I want to say it's got a bit of a cult following, uh, and for good reason. The story dates back to 1881, so you know, in the 140 year history, uh, and there was quite, I think, an interesting story around its its creation. Um, it was created, it was built by three brothers, the Harvey brothers, whose father um, had actually passed away and left a, a, an inheritance sum for for the an inheritance sum for the sons. Um, the family were already involved in whiskey making, and according to record, had two distilleries in Glasgow. The intention by the sons was to set up a third distillery very much around um, producing whiskey for blending with their other two. Um, unfortunately, they had a bit of a falling out and things didn't quite go according to plan. Um, one son was, was responsible for the, the design of the distillery. The other son was responsible for kind of managing the finances. And the third son was, uh, was going to be responsible for the actual running of the distillery. The way things turned out, they had a bit of an altercation between them and the, 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 the one Harvey brother who uh, was going to actually be involved in production was then not involved in the distillery going forward. So it didn't set the distillery off on a good foot. And then if you enter the 1900s uh, and the, the kind of the proceeding few um, uh, decades, you have you know, a, a period where there was a lot of opening and closing of distilleries ac across Scotland, you know, World War I and World War II. Um, but very much our kind of the modern day story of Brooklady starts around, you know, mid 1980s when it was very much then still closed, a reopened, um, uh, operated for about 1995, reclosed in 1995, reopened in 2001. So in 2000, a, a private group of investors led by an individual call, called Mark Rainier, who at the time was, um, you know, founded Murray McDavid, who's an independent bottling brand. Um, Mark Rainier, you know, got together some guys, a private group, and they bought the distillery in approximately just no, it was late 2000, is around December. Um, on kind of on record, it looks as uh, the sum was 6.5 million pounds that they bought the distillery for. You can imagine that at that time you have a distillery that had been lying dormant for several years, um, and you need a team to head this up. Um, the one of the, the the most I want to think famous Scotch whiskey names or names in Scotch whiskey is an indiv individual called Jim McEwen, and Mark Rainier was was successful in bringing Jim McEwen across, who uh, at the time was work, work, working at the Bowmore Distillery, uh, and Jim, a very famous and very kind of legendary figure in Scotch whiskey, uh, started work wa working. I want to say walking. Started working at the age of fifteen at the Bowmore Distillery, which was back in 1963. 37 years, you know, that was his tenure. He then was enticed by Jim McEwen to move across um, to Brooklady and to help Mark open the, the and get the Brooklady distillery restarted. Jim was then hired as master distiller and production director. And what very much happened between kind of January uh, and May 2001, just after they bought it, was a complete dismantling and reassembling of the distillery. So uh, at the time when the distillery was built in 1881, which was kind of Victorian times, the distillery was state of the art. However, fast forward to you know, 2000, nothing had changed at the distillery. So now you've got a new, you know, a new group of individuals involved, new owners, a uh, distillery that's been lying dormant for a few years, that's very old equipment, and their task now is to get this up and running. So you can imagine the work involved in, uh, in just making sure you know, the equipment can do what it needs to do. In 2001, distillation restarted, so a very exciting time. Uh, and the distillery today produces three distinct styles of single malt. So all scotch or single malt, of course, um, all from the Brookladdy distillery, but labeled under slightly different uh, names based on the type of spirit. So you have uh, the, the standard Brookladdy spirit, which is approximately 50% of production these days. It is unpeated, so there's no smokiness to it at all. Uh, depending on your views, that's quite kind of out of the norm for what Isla whiskey is known for. Uh, approximately 40% of the production is Port Charlotte, which is this new kind of you know uh, style bottling uh, that is peated, heavily peated to 40 parts per million. 
Uh, for those watching who've watched a few of our episodes, we chatted to Brendan McCarran from Ardbeg and Glen Ranji, talked about the peating levels of Ardbeg. Port Charlotte peated to 40 ppm, which is on the heavily peated side. And then there's the experimental range from Brooklady, um, which is optimal. Uh, you can see some of these canisters up here. Uh, and actually, this is uh, this is for later drinking, which is this beautiful uh, optimal bottle. Octomore is ultra heavily peated. Uh, I, I like to refer to it as stupidly heavily peated. Uh, it is just off the charts. Uh, it is a very experimental range. Approximately 10% of what the, the distillery produces is destined for Octomore releases. Uh, and it's very much just to test the boundaries of what peated whiskey can be. So where Port Charlotte is approximately 40 parts per million, you then have Octomore, which the first release was about 80 to 90. Uh, and some of the subsequent releases have gone all the way through the hundreds to the 200 parts per million, all the way up. The highest, I believe, was the Master Class 8.3 Octomore, which is 309 parts per million phenols, which just means it is incredibly smoky to a point where you know many producers, distillers did not think it would be possible to produce such a style of whiskey. Uh, today, the distillery has a capacity to produce approximately 1.5 million liters of pure alcohol a year. Uh, we'll talk to Adam just to understand kind of what production currently looks like. Um, and um, the, the Adam himself, moving on to Adam. <clears throat> Adam uh, is currently master distiller. Uh, he very much took over from Jim McEwen. Uh, Jim uh, retired um, in, I think it was approximately 2012, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and um, Adam was his successor, was earmarked as his successor. Adam joined the distillery in 2004 uh, and started working in the Brooklady Visitor Center and the shop and giving tours. And in 2016, he then uh, became head distiller. 2016, sorry. So my Jim McEwen retirement year was incorrect then. Uh, when Jim left in 2016, Adam took his, his spot. Um, Adam has been through the whole production process at the distillery uh, from humble beginnings as a tour guide and in the, in the distillery shop in 2004. 12 years later, then, to then taking the mantle of head distiller, taking over from Jim McEwen, very big shoes to fill. Um, and Adam will join us uh, in a moment or two um, as the current head distiller of Brook Uh The other individual in very much involved um, at the distilleries in, is the production director, Alan Logan. Um, between him and Adam, so Alan and Adam, between Alan Logan and Adam Hannett, uh, what we know of Brooklady, Port Charlotte, and Optimal is very much uh, within their kind of responsibility, what they bring to market. So very excited to have Adam join us. We've had some great guests, but um, and you know, Adam is, uh, is 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 another one. So we're very we're very fortunate to have him join us. I am going to um, just get Adam up and invite him to join us. Excuse the delay. Um, it will be coming to us live from Isla, um, and should be joining us now. Adam, good afternoon. How are you doing? I'm all right. Thanks, Mike. How are you? Nice to see you. Good, thank you. Can you hear and see me okay? I can. Can you hear and see me okay? I can indeed. It looks as if you are in the visitor center. Am I correct? Uh, you, not quite. Um, uh, again, Isla's not known for its, uh, its good quality video connection, so I have to come down to the distillery. And I'm in uh, one of the meeting rooms here. We've got a good selection. Of Brilliant. Almost as good as yours, actually. Well, yeah, I, I wanted to make you feel at home, so I just I got out some of the bottles and you know just to make sure that you, you you felt comfortable and we could maybe get you to speak about a few things that maybe you'd be tight lipped about otherwise. Oh, I see, I see. Maybe well, maybe a few things, if you see a few secrets come out, but uh, I didn't notice <laughs> the uh, the the array of colours and optimals all behind you there when you were speaking. So yeah, it looks great. Yeah, as you can see, I'm I'm a, I'm a fan. No surprise. Nice to see. Nice to see. Yeah. Um, you so uh, just before we start, uh, just to check, obviously, you know, the UK, like the rest of the world, you know, there's some uh, there's lockdown measures in place. Uh, you and your family all well and keeping healthy? Yeah, we're all fine. Um, yeah, there's ugh, you have up, good days and bad days. I'm sure everyone's the same. You know, where um, the sun's shining and everything's great. Um, you know, it's, you can't you don't really think about it. And then there's some days where you know you can't do things you normally do. 
And um, yeah, it's quite hard it's, in some ways. I'm sure everyone's going to do the same thing, uh, but it's great to be able to do things like this where you can, you know, we can still keep in touch with people, um, still have conversations, still share a dram, you know, we're not side by side, you know, we can still uh, absolutely interact. Yeah, it's just good. Absolutely. Um, so at the moment, the distillery is closed for production, I assume. That's right. Yeah. So we 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 closed um, back at the end of March, the twentieth of March. Um, we we decided that um, you know as as the situation was progressing and we were watching what was happening, we we took the decision to close quite early, um, just because we thought with so many people on site, um, we want to keep people safe. You know, we we're obviously quite uh, quite famous for you know providing a lot of jobs. You know, there's about 80, 90 people on site at the distillery. You know, at any one time. So. We were, we just had to stop. We had to shut down and keep people safe. So, um, yeah, we haven't made whiskey for, for a long time. It's about, uh, about 140,000 litres of alcohol we haven't made and we're counting, you know, as we go. So it's quite a considerable chunk of uh, whiskey we, we should have produced but haven't. Uh, but as I say, the most important thing is keeping people safe. Absolutely. What's a, what, what's, a, what's the impact on the distillery being shut for, uh, you know, a short duration? So, you know, hopefully when soon as things start petering out and, and the distillery can get up and running, you know, are there are a lot of considerations to doing that once it's been offline for two, three months? There is, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's some things, again, we've, we've kept, for example, the boiler running, um, you know, there's, there's things where we've been able to keep going. One of the things we've had, uh, a lovely spell of weather, as I say, you know, the weather's been fantastic, but that impacts our stocks of water. So we, you know, we, we may want to get started. You know, for example, we may say in June. You know, if the situation is ready for us to start back, um, then we would say let's start in June. But if we don't have wet, uh, water, then it's not happening. Um, right. So that's that's it. You know, Scottish summer is usually quite wet, so we're, <laughs> we've got our fingers crossed. Um, but uh, but in terms in terms of getting up and running, you know, we will need to um, speak to some of the suppliers about getting barrels in. And, being an island, being on an island, the ferry is um, really what determines the ferry service at the moment is, is one ferry a day, really. There's, there's only emergency supplies coming in. Um, so we need to make sure that situation is ready for us to, uh, to be able to uh, get barrels in, get, uh, get malt in. Um, there's a lot of things you know, we're kind of worrying about, you know, contingencies just now. We've still got about a thousand tons of last year's barley that was harvested on the island. Uh, on either, and we would normally have shifted uh, that as, as we produce, you know, get malt in from the next malt in, so we then send barley back up to the market. We have a supply, a rolling supply, right. and that hasn't happened. Um, so we, we see the farmers have sown the barley already this year, and the, the fields have started to turn green with the barley coming through already. Um, that's a Bit of an issue as to where we put this year's harvest. We're right. working a lot of things. There's, there's a lot of a lot of things going on in the background to, yeah. to make sure we're in a position to start again. Later. Yeah, I mean, I, in general, the distillery obviously quite you know quite a, a, a well-oiled machine, as you say, in terms of you know just you know when you need something, it's it's kind of just in time. Um, so I, I would imagine kind of that that compounding knock-on effect, you know, as as this progresses or you know gets delayed. Um, and, and I mean, so you know, Brooklady very well known for championing local barley, uh, you know, and and local in your sense very much means Isla barley, the the, the idea of terroir, etc. I mean, do, does well, you know what 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 will would this have any impact? You know, for for a big distiller who's just getting barley all the time, not a problem. As you say, now you you deal with very certain farmers around very specific kind of you know growing seasons. Yeah. Um, you know, how how do you ever how do you overcome this? Is there going to be an impact going forward on some of these limited releases? Well, I suppose it's, it's at times like this where we realise um, why other people do things the way they do, <laughs> because it's a lot easier. Um, but it, it's not going to stop us. It's not going to slow us down too much. I think, uh, as I say, we're committed to doing this. It's, it's, it's who we are, you know, in terms of working with farmers and, um, and the barley supply. We're committed to it, and we'll, you know, we'll find a way around it. We, we won't uh, stop. Um, in terms of our, as you touched on before, our kind of production capacity, we're making about a million litres of alcohol every year, and that's relatively easy for us to produce. You know, we don't we don't push ourselves. You know, we we do work kind of around the clock, as we like to say, we work twenty four seven, five days a week. You know, so we uh, <laughs> we're not we're not push. We have capacity to expand. But we do have um, shutdowns or maintenance, or um, you know, we're not working flat out through the year. You know, we give ourselves time to make whiskey slowly. Right? 
with that capacity, it means that if we were to get started you know, June, July, we should have capacity to, to quite comfortably um, catch up with any production we've missed. Um, right. Logistics we can work around, but uh, in terms of being able to work with the, the farmers, we're, we're working with last year's barley anyway. So we have all that, that's, that's, that's done. We just need to get it molded. Um, the, uh, the, in terms of next year's, we'll find a way around the supply. We're committed to the supply of all the, um, the farmers, whether it be on Isla or whether it be um, you know, in Orkney or Aberdeenshire, outside Edinburgh, wherever it may be, these single farms, we're still committed to, to working with them in the same way. So. Right. So I mean, sorry, anyway. My, my understanding is, is that a lot of that supply wouldn't even be there if it wasn't for Brook Luddy's demand. And by yeah. that, I mean, you know, because you've been such a champion, you've encouraged and you've worked with, with, with farmers to produce specific crops just for you, yeah. whereas historically yeah. they may not have. Um, so you know, it's it's you, 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 it's always a problem you've created, but it's it's a great problem and a normal yeah. circumstance. Yeah, it's it's a good a good a good example of that is the, the bear barley. Um, I, I don't know if uh, I don't think you guys I don't know if you have the bear barley product in South Africa. Or, you know. No, I mean we, we know of it, but uh, we we haven't we haven't had it historically. It's it's a, it's an amazing amazing whiskey and the 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 kind of origins of it so there's, there's kind of like any good scottish story there's loads of different versions to this uh, the, but effectively the origins were working with an old distillery and we were keen to work with all varieties of barley and, and kind of break out of the commodity and try something new and uh, we kind of came across and made some connections with um, some farmers up in orkney who brought, who brought their barley they've grown up for hundreds if not thousands of years it's a um, kind of a heritage variety and um, it doesn't change, you know. It's, it's, it's not been bred or anything else. It's specific, but it suits the open climate. It, 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 um, aspects of its character that suit being grown in, in kind of remote, uh, kind of poor soil areas. Um, and they were growing it, and they make uh, they make uh, bannocks, they make oat cakes, they make uh, beer with it. You know, they, um, so there's a small industry in Orkney producing products from this bear barley. And um, we've decided you know, that we'd like to try distilling it and. Up to the, the University of the Highlands and Islands and the kind of agricultural um, arm of a branch up in Orkney, um, as they were doing research into the properties that Bear has. Um, because it's a very old strain, it has different properties, you know, it grows in very poor soils. So or again, in, in terms of you know feeding the world, that maybe has good applications elsewhere around the world. It's an interesting strain, they're doing lots of work with it. Um, and really, what we've created is a supply chain where we'll encourage the farmers to. Uh, for us, we'll buy the, the grain, uh, which means they're able to keep funding the research and keep um, kind of doing the, the development of it and keep it growing. Um, and it, it's an interesting story, even just from that point of view, uh, keeping uh, an old kind of heritage variety of people alive. Right. But the amazing thing about it is that um, it, it yields terribly in comparison to modern varieties in terms of litres of alcohol per tonne of barley. Uh, right. Because of the logistics of it, it's very expensive. But it makes amazing whiskey. Right. And that's what we're really interested in. That's that's the really important thing. It makes stunningly good whiskey. Um, so it's an exploration of many, many different things. But like you say, we've created that whole um, kind of supply chain, that whole um, way of doing that. You know, it, it's mutually beneficial for, for everyone involved. Um, and and we're really, really keen to make whiskey with, with different varieties of barley than you would just you know pick off the off the shelf. You know? How far? I mean, is it is it a, is it a lifelong experiment? And by that I mean, you know, do you think in terms of kind of what you'd like to try and things you'd like to test and have farmers grow for you and see what the yields like, see what the flavors are like? You know, is it something that you you could because as a, as a you know as a distillery, Brook Lady have been doing that safely since kind of early two thousands. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like you kind of have a good grip grasp of things and there's just a few other things you'd like to try or is it like well actually it's a it's a treadmill and it's just we could do this for the rest of our you know future yeah i, I think naturally that the, you will we'll never get to a point where we go great that's it we've figured everything out you know i think we will always be in this kind of exploration of barley this uh, this kind of connection with barley i mean as far as the, in the whiskey industry um there's, there's so much done in terms of you know research and barley there's so much kind of done to preserve it and to, to push and to uh, move forward but often what we find is that um in, in the kind of the big scale and commodity um, things are also like the lowest common denominator things are you know the safest things are the, the, the maximum yielder and right. you make great whiskey with this barley but you're almost 
to doing all these kind of things, making sure that um, you know, the yield is good for everyone. Yield is important, but the flavor is also very important. And it seems like that in the whiskey industry in Scotland, that was that was kind of lost somewhere. You know, it was it was about making sure things were the same, uh, making sure there was consistency in the flavor. And naturally, when you're working with whiskey, the way the way I see it, the way we see it at Brooklady is that flavors shouldn't be the same. You know, the, the barley will grow in different places, uh, you know, the same variety in different places. Should get you know, right. uh, particular years, you know, the harvest, the, um, the the vintage, if you like, should should change. And yet, the whiskey industry has got this idea that you know every product should taste the same all the time. Drink a, a a ten-year-old or whatever distillery today, it should taste the same ten years later. You know? So, all the distillers are kind of fighting. The whole industry is kind of fighting to, to make sure everything is the same. It's good, right. but I think for us at Brooklady, we're not scared of of saying well, actually, I've got a little jar of the uh, classic here, and it's a great example of a whiskey where it, the style is the same, but the flavor profile changes kind of batch by batch as we produce it because. Actually, we're, we're, you know, we want to express the same character, that same elegance of Brooklady, the same kind of kind of character. But I'm, I don't want I don't want to only sell a cask that tastes the same all the time. I want to you know, maybe add a little bit more sherry cask in one year, or maybe use a little bit more Isla barley in, in, in one expression, one vintage, and see how that develops. So I think that naturally, as, as you as you make whiskey in that way, you look around at the barley and the, the supply, and you want to is we focus on terroir. Um, terroir is not something you hear in the whiskey industry, you know, five years ago, ten years ago, and yet it's the heart of what we do. And I tell you, it, it's it's an amazing thing to be able to make whiskey with freedom like that, where you, you're not confined to a specific recipe. You can explore and you can see how the whiskey comes to be. You know, and it, it's it's an interesting take on whiskey. We think differently. But that's important. Absolutely, and and I think I mean my hope as a whiskey enthusiasts would be that with, with you know all the new distilleries popping up is that you know they also need to differentiate themselves and hopefully in time some of them take a, a page out of you know your book out of Brooke Laddie's play playlist so to speak and also do a little bit more experimentation you know we, we have enough whiskey that's consistent and you know kind of you know highly comp competed price wise uh, you know but that's not what all whiskey drinkers want there's obviously different markets there's different yeah. types of drinkers uh, and you know in terms of you know, a lot of us want something that, as you say, maybe is not that consistent. There's batch variation, but that's what makes it exciting. It gives you a reason to come back and try the ten-year-old again because you know, you know, the next batch is going to be slightly different. So you want to understand how and why. Yeah, absolutely. I think. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, what I'm talking about other distilleries and the consistency. I mean, making amazing whiskey. I mean, some of the whiskey produced in Scotland, um, you know, and produced in these ways is is incredible whiskey, delicious whiskey, but. It isn't necessarily have that variety to it, you know. It's, it's, it is what it is, and it's very good. And I think we just see the opportunity for ourselves to to try new things, to be experimental, um, and it's really all born from, um, you know, just just this, this, what's the possibilities? You know, let's look at the ingredients. Let's think about, you know, how do we make the best single malt we, we possibly can? You know, we need to start. You, know, you leave no stone unturned. You look at the bar. You look at the casks. Um, you know, you look at the people and skills they have and how they make it and where you do what. Um, you make it local, you know, we can only do what we can do with, um, you know, with what's local to us. And that, that's, you know, we write Brooklady on the on the label, you know, we're Brooklady Distillery, you know, it's, it's written here. You know, yeah. so we have to express that and in, in, in making sure as much of that process is done here as possible. Um, so a lot of it is, is, a, is a philosophy, a lot of it is a, is a belief and the way it comes through. Whiskey. I think it's honest, you know, I think it's, it's transparent. And I think that's a, a good thing because the whiskey industry or the people who are drinking whiskey, uh, have more access to information. They want more information. They, you know, people want to educate themselves on what they're drinking and understand this product. And you know, we're in a great position to be able to say, look, we want to make whiskey in that same way. We want to tell you what's in that product. We want to tell you how we make this. This is interesting to us. You know. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, so I always think that you know, sometimes you pick up a bottle and you know, you, you you're keen on details and some more information, and you look at it and it's completely devoid of information. And I, I always wonder why that is because the truth is, if somebody doesn't care. Then it's fine. But if someone mm. does care, you can cater to to all drinkers by putting more information on. Nobody looks at a label and thinks, "Oh, I don't want to know that. I want less information." Right? Yeah. So you, you know, it's. I mean, the 
I, I, I was having a discussion earlier this week about kind of, you know, hand selection. You know, all, you know every cask is hand selected. We don't have robots yet picking casks, not yet. Yeah. I mean, that might come, right? <clears throat> and, uh, and this idea of, you know, just matured in oak. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a requirement for Scotch whiskey. That doesn't tell me anything. Yeah, yeah that, that's it. I mean, I think that the transparency thing is really important. It's in many ways, it's quite hard, even, you know, for us, we, we want to be very transparent. But, um, for example, if I'm looking behind your head and I can see that Brocladi classic uh, uh, tin behind you, um, it's very subtle. So it's hard to, hard to see if I spotted it there. Um, <laughs> when, you, when you look at that, you know, it would be really easy. We, we want to put the information on the tin, but we do relatively small batches. And when you order tins from a manufacturer, you know, it's, it's the minimum order, maybe 10,000. Tins and so you have to you can't you can't uh, necessarily you know you have to be quite generic in, in the way you have it on the on the bottle. Um, great thing about the kind of technology that we have is um, you know we we for example have a batch code so each batch we we make we print it on the bottle so when you buy a bottle you can look at the, the, the bottle you can go onto the website put in that code and you'll be able to see um, you know the, the vintages the spirit types the um, cast types, you know, the information that makes up that, that, uh, that whiskey. So to your point exactly, you don't, you look at the bottle, you don't know, you don't have to find out. But if you do want to know, then you can go further and find out. And that's, I think, the way we've kind of got to. The, the regulation in Scotch whiskey um, kind of prevent us almost from doing that, but we believe it's, it's the right thing to do. And um, the, the regulations, I can't remember the specific, 3.1 section, whatever it is, of the, of the uh, whiskey regulations, but you can interpret it in different ways. And most people will interpret it as we're not going to give you the, the information. Yeah. In this whiskey, you know, most blenders, again, over the years, to protect their customers, protect what they do. Um, but I think we just interpret it differently and we say, well, actually, as a, as a whiskey drinker, as an interested as a whiskey drinker, if you want to know, <laughs> we want to tell you. you know, it's, it's fine. So, yeah, it's, I think it's there if you want it. I think, you know, it, even in terms of, um, you know, if we talk about a, a vintage whiskey and we talk about a, a Port Charlotte, uh, 2012, Isle of Barley. There's a lot of information even just in that title. You know it's heavily peated. You know it's uh, with Isle of Rum Barley. We'll tell you the farms that that barley was grown on. Um, you know, we'll put that on the on the tin for that review. So we, we, we try and give as much information as we possibly can because... That's for us. That's what makes the story of a whiskey. We don't give you a story of, um, you know, the, the perhaps a Jura or anything like that. You know, the eagles flying over glens and deers and how many stag, you know, stags there were. And it's not about tartan and all that kind of stuff. That when we make a whiskey, it's, a, it's telling you about what that whiskey is and where it's come from, where that spirits come from. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the truth is, that there is so much information to you know to each release that you know there's enough information to share about that that you don't really have to kind of you know, really stretch out and, and create some kind of fictitious story about, you know, some pretty, you know, whatever, maybe some pretty history. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think it's an excellent point. Um, in your glass, sorry, do you want to just share what you're drinking? I think you mentioned the Brooklady Classic. Is that correct? Yeah, it, it is. It's, uh, it's the classic. So um, it, it, it's funny. It's a, it's a drown that, um, you know, it's kind of a house style of Brooklady, if you like. And during the lockdown, I, I haven't actually tasted it until just now. Um, uh, also, yes. so, so yesterday, um, and we're looking at getting some uh, some bottling started. So that we, with the regulations and the way things uh, look in the UK at the moment, we may be able to start bottling, um, albeit with a skeleton crew, with you know just a very very basic as a test with one bottling of classic. And we had actually already prepared it for bottling before we shut down. I had to do a, a little quality check on it in the morning. Um, so it's a, it's a hard life. I had to get up um, very early. I'm down to the distillery, so at seven o'clock in the morning, I'm drinking some uh, some classic. And is, this not... the, is this the next batch that in, is to be bottled? Is this your kind yes. of okay? Yeah. So this is from the, the the vatting that's already been done. That's sitting in stainless steel, waiting for bottles. Yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I was just checking it to make sure you know that nothing's happened to it, but just again to make sure everything's okay. And yeah, seven o'clock in the morning, having a having a dram of classic, and it, it just struck me, you know, that it, this, this is an absolutely beautiful dram. Um, and and so that's yeah. I thought I'd have a little drama of that this afternoon as well. You know, so that's what's in my glass. So uh, I'm busy on the the new Port Charlotte. Um, so released last year, right? New packaging, and I, I, I yeah. do love the packaging. Um, I, I think a nice differentiator because it was using the same bottles as the Brooklady bottle, right? So uh, you know, on a shelf they really pop, and and they're very different styles of whiskey in terms of the For sure. level. Yeah. Um, 
but uh, yeah, so great whiskey and uh, cheers, Solange Javar. Yeah, cheers, man. Thanks very much. Uh, it's yeah, nice to um, see someone enjoying the Port Charlotte 10. I think it's uh, it's, it's, it's interesting, as, as you say, you know, that um, you know, we used to use for Port Charlotte, you know, the um, same glass, the same kind of labeling. It, it was very difficult to differentiate between Brocladi and Port Charlotte unless you really knew. And yeah. I think we just we watched Port Charlotte grow from you know, its conception in 2001 to, to uh, watch it grow, watch it develop as a spirit. It's, it's a stunning whiskey, absolutely stunning whiskey. So it, it deserves its kind of place, its own its own image, if you like, its own identity. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a great whiskey. I mean, we, we've, yeah, got some great spirit in the warehouses. And, and uh, again, the great thing for me was getting the, the freedom to go and create that whiskey and choose that, that, that style. And uh, yeah. So if, if, if anyone's uncertain as to your kind of, uh, you know, your responsibility, there's your signature on the bottom, right? That's it. So half of my job is sitting at the bottling, the end of the bottom line with a pen. Did I get the, the, the kind of the proportions correct? So is out of the current production at Brooklady, 40% plus or minus is, is Port Charlotte, 50% uh, plus or minus Brooklady, and then 10% for uh, Octomore? Yeah, there are thereabouts. Yeah, there's maybe a little bit less Octomore made, uh, just a bit of variances each each year, depending on a few things. But but yeah, basically that's that's it. Um, it hasn't always been that way. You know, over the years, there's been uh, varying levels of different different spirits, and um, I think over the years we've we put Charlotte, we've seen that you know we, we didn't used to produce forty percent. It's maybe thirty percent or twenty percent. You know, some years. So the stocks are relatively limited, which you know is probably why it's quite hard to find uh, just now. The Charlotte ten, we, we you know we. Uh, of course, what you make ten years ago when you sell now, you know. The, uh, I actually I, I noticed um, on the on the chat there that I think Andy Watts was uh, in the, in the chat there somewhere. And I was on a, a whiskey cast episode with, uh, with recently, yeah. we all talking about the the crystal ball, you know, making whiskey. That is what you do today. You anticipate what's going to happen 10, 15, 20 years down the line, but it can change minute by minute, you know. So, um, you know what we need. Uh, sorry, uh, Mark. What I was going to say, what we made years ago, uh, we, we now think we should have made a lot more. You know, uh, and it's interesting. You know, a production level of a million liters of alcohol is it's quite uh, it's quite small. But uh, I think looking at the plans you have for the future, we'll start to see that increase uh, right. gradually over the next few years. Yeah, I mean, there's also the, the additional complexity, you know, for Brooklady in that you know only kind of re you know reopened 2001. Um, obviously, at this time, you know, in terms of investment and equipment, a lot of work to be done, um, and you can't you can't just start running the distillery, you know, full capacity. Um, yeah. And so you know, there's there's this kind of that, that, that period of just kind of gradually making sure that everything is you know is, is in its rightful working order. Um, you know, I know there's there's kind of the, the famous story of of the mash tun rakes, you know, breaking and, and taking three months to to try and find a you know. Four months. Yeah. Yeah. Four months, yeah. <laughs> so, so you know, I guess the real test for now is is in ten years' time, do you have enough whiskey? Because uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to think there's very little excuse as it currently stands, apart from maybe a global pandemic. <laughs> yeah, but uh, if your forecasts are, are all right in terms of you know demand down the line, um, yeah. Adam, I'm quite keen to. So you know, in terms of the the, the different spirits being produced between Brooklady, Port Charlotte, and Octomore, you know, what is the regime at the distillery like? Because you know, it's not the. It's usually not the case that you know you go one week by one week. You know, it's usually kind of set periods throughout the year. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'd be very interested if you could maybe elaborate on that, as well as in kind of the complexities between you know changing uh, through the spirits as you go along. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really good point. Actually, really good question. Um, so, uh, as you say, the three different peating levels, we will kind of distill at, at various times. We don't really chop and change between them all as much as we can. Um, but we, we differentiate the spirits we make, um, you know, by, by field or by farm as well. So there's various different spirits we do um, in Brooklady um, with the, the, the barley um, specific releases like bare barley. Um, what we refer to as our regional trials, where we take single farm barley from different farms across Scotland, still them separately. Um, there's organic, there's biodynamic, and there's different certification that goes through the processes as well. Um, and so we end up probably producing about 16 or 17 different spirit types throughout the year. Uh, wow. And each each time we do that, um, when we stop from, let's say, going from the, the Aberdeenshire regional onto the Lothian, um, we'll 
clean through the, the equipment and change the faints. So the, the, the faints you have in the distillation. If you, you know, you cross the, if you didn't cross those over, when you start um, producing the Aberdeenshire, you still have the Lothian faints in the system. So you want to make sure that the, the flavors are specific. Uh, again, you don't want peated faints going into unpeated whiskey, for example. So, um, there'll be a, a process where we decant all of the faints out into, into tanks and decant the, the correct faints back in again. So um, that's a, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, you know, 10 hours of a, of a job and a bit of cleaning here and there and everywhere. But uh, it's very important that we, we have segregation between everything so that we understand exactly where the flavors come from. Um, and in, in terms of, of these kind of different spirit types, you know, whether it's Isla Grown, whether it's bare barley, whether it's bi banana, organic, optimal, whatever it may be, um, each time we're, we're kind of um, changing, you know, everything is um, it all kind of kind of doesn't aid the smooth running of a distillery, if you know what I mean. It, it, it takes a lot of time and effort. And uh, I remember speaking to one of the guys at the Maltings up at Baird's Malt a few years ago, and uh, we were kind of going through the contracts. And, uh, you know, what the barley is they, they be able to supply us, you know, from different farms, barley. And um, we were asking, does anyone else do this? You know, how how many other um, kind of contracts do you have with most other distilleries? Is it, the closest one uh, is a distillery where they do three. So uh, so they're doing three different kind of styles or right. types of year. We're doing about seventeen. You know, so right, that's it, it just, I think, again, it, it doesn't make it easy. We have to factor in things like the logistics of the Isle of Bali and, and where things are grown in, in, in different parts of the country. A distillation program is built around, uh, for example, the, making sure we've got through all the Isle of Bali before the next harvest comes in. Right. Uh, so we tend to do a lot of the Brocladi at the, the beginning of the year and then probably onto the repeated uh, Charlotte and Octomo towards the end of the year. Okay. In, in terms of, I mean, so you know, every step in the in the production process, to some degree, is 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 adjusted, right, for the different peating levels. So you know, the fermentation duration I would expect is not necessarily the same. You know, the stills are run differently. Uh, I mean, you know, what what are a few of the details around that? Well, it's interesting actually. We, we we tend to, in terms of production, keep things almost as, as you know, the process as similar as possible. You know, the, the temptation would be, I think, particularly with making, if we talk about Octomore, Temptation would be that we try and make that as peaty as possible. You know, I mean, that's kind of where we built the reputation of Octomore within the world's most heavily peated whiskey. Um, if you do that, what you, what you find, particularly in or tip stills as an example, um, when you are distilling that the phenols, the group of, of kind of chemicals that give us that, that uh, smoky flavor, the phenols come through you know, towards the end of the cut to the, right. to the tails. So if we were looking to get a, a peatier whiskey, we could maybe right. Keep that cup running a bit longer, but we don't because what we really want to see is is the, the kind of classic style we have. Clary, it's light, it's elegant, and it's, it's specific to you know. It really just gives us a real purity in the spirit, and we want that to come through in Port Charlotte. We want that to come through in Optimal. So we're not necessarily distilling for the peat and the phenol. And so what you tend to find when you get tasting Optimal, or something that maybe like 170 or 100 and 200 ppm, whatever it may be. Actually, it's really gentle. It's really elegant. The smoke is dry. It's kind of barbecue, not, not you know, medicinal bonfire, yeah, medicinal kind of oily flavors. It's, it's light and it's fresh, and we want to retain that characteristic right. and just see where the smoke fits around. So, and I suppose again, if you if you were thinking about the, you know, if you're looking at, for example, Tig Tewa and uh, the Isle of Bali, uh, as opposed to Scottish barley, maybe tempted to distill those slightly differently depending on how they ferment or depending on um, the clarity of the water or these kind of things. But if we keep everything the same, then we know where the flavor differences come from. Right. The process right. Isn't, isn't tweaking it. We know where the flavor differences come from. So, okay. for example, yeast is an area where we, we, you know, we could do so much experimentation with different types of yeast. But we, we use the same variety of yeast all the time for all the spirits um, so that we, we're not, again, just so we know where the flavors are coming from. If you, if you change everything, you learn nothing. You know, so. Right, right, absolutely. So I mean, it's uh, yeah, that's uh, that makes sense. And I think it also, to some degree, does that allow you to have a a distillery DNA that runs through, you know, unpeated, pe heavily peated, and crazy peated? You know, so I mean, most yeah. people think oh, the DNA for a peated whiskey would be different, you know, compared to the DNA for an unpeated whiskey, even though it's from the same distillery. I think you know, I, my takeaway from what you've said there is that. 
you know, the peating level aside, there's there's a there's a an element, you know, a thread that runs through the different releases, regardless of the peating level. Yeah, for sure, I, I, absolutely. I think we want to have that that same style. And the other thing, I, I suppose, is that the, the peat and the, the phenols are very can be quite a, a dominant kind of character, and they can hide a multitude of sins. You know, they, you know, if you're looking to produce a lot of spirit, you know, the, the phenols will come through, and they'll, they'll any any kind of off notes in that spirit. The phenols and a bit of time in a cask will kind of mask those over. But you know, that's that's not where we want. That's not the game we want to play. We want to be making really good quality spirit. And if you taste, you know. Cloudy spirit, Port Charlotte spirit, Octomo spirit from the still. It's really, really good, really palatable, really easy to, to take at high strength. Um, so we're starting off from a very good place. Um, and I think that's only going to get better as it, as it matures. And I think that's that's what making single malt whiskey is. It's not cutting any corners, you know, it's about making sure the spirit you are distilling is the very best it can possibly be. Yeah. Um, how, uh, so I mean, you're talking about so 15 to what's so 17 different types of spirits, which is, you know, a, a several factor larger than most producers. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think on a, on a, on a, on a, on a good day, there's quite a challenge for any distillery, you know, looking after several hundred thousands of casks, you know, you have all the, the history of the wood, you've got different locations of warehousing. Um, and then now you have 17 different spirits and you're notoriously known for, uh, you know, kind of cask experimentation as well. Yeah. You know, so, so I mean, how, you know, Brooklady is well known for not having, I want to say any automation, right? I mean, yeah. it's, there's no boards, there's thermometers, it's old school, it's very hands-on. How the hell do you guys keep track of 17 spirits across multiple warehouses, different cask history and styles? You know, is, is that at least kind of digitized? <laughs> uh, to a point, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, there's, there's, um, there's one of these. And uh, I'm one of these. That's that tends to be what uh, what comes through a lot of the time, you know. Um, there's a lot of notes, there's a lot of things like that, and I think it's just being intimate with the spirit as well, you know, because everything's here, because everything's on the island. Um, you're never too far away from from the cast, and we know what it is we're working on. We know, you know, again, we don't know any other way, to be honest. You know, it's, it's all around us. And we do, um, you know, get really excited about the details, so naturally we keep track of it. We do have spreadsheets that control the stock. We do, have, you know, that show us the stock. Uh, I should say, um, you know, we do have kind of systems for managing the inventory. Um, but really, it's down to going around and, and sampling and tasting and blending and mixing. And um, when things are ready, they're, they're, they're ready. You know? and it's all sort of in there, really. You know, that's that's, uh, that's the, the best way. If you don't have a feeling for the stock, if you don't have a feeling for uh, what's in the warehouses, then um, you know, that's kind of losing something with whiskey. It should be about instinct, feeling. It should be about creation. Yeah, well, if you're able to do that, that's brilliant, right? That's, I mean, that's how it should be. I don't think most producers are able to do that, you know, maybe because of volume, um, you know, but, uh, you know, kudos. And this is, I, I do think, why Brooklady stand out, um, you know, when, when kind of on the current landscape. Uh, I mean, so as, as kind of the individual then who's responsible for putting these, these, these battings together, let's say you're doing a new release, um, you know, now you obviously, you've been there for, for a, for a, you know, prolonged period. You kind of know what's where, but I mean, where do you start if you have that much different spirit and that many different casks, you know, in terms of, let's just say, you know, let's just say the, the PC 10, which came to market last year, you know, where do you start on something like that? If there's just so much out there, I mean, it, it again, it's obviously a skill that, that you have, but, but talk us a little bit through maybe that, that, that approach mentally, because I'm assuming in your mind you have an idea before you even go and start putting casks. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, as we are, you know, known for experimentation and, and trying different things, but we do know also kind of what works. So a lot of the casks we fill will be um, ex bourbon barrels. You know, probably I would say like sixty-five to seventy percent will be will be uh, bourbon barrels. Um, so maybe there's things there in relatively small quantities. You know, the, the, for the longest time, we've been using uh, kind of extra wine casks from uh, throughout Europe. And you find that, um, you know, when you use them initially, the flavors from the, the, the wine that was in there before and the type of oak are really, really powerful and really interesting releases with them. And then you use the oak a second time. And, and it's the, really the oak coming through and over a long period of time with that spirit, you um, get flavors that are less diverse, if you like, than that first book. Right. So, um, Almost kind of knowing the stops we've got, knowing what whiskey we've got, and blending and different tastes, you kind of come up with a, a loose frame 
that you then that build that whiskey around and maybe we, we tweak the percentages here or there or we um, sampling the 10 there's maybe 11 or 12 year old whiskey in there as well you can you can tweak things you can look at things to, uh, to kind of based on what you've got maybe 10 years ago 11 years ago uh, to be able to create different flavors i think that that's the thing that we're not trying to replicate the same thing all the time we can, we can move the flavors here and there a little bit as we uh, as we feel the need um as long as it's still expressing the right flavors the right characters it's still got that same quality i don't really mind if it's you know 65 or 70 percent fresh bourbon and you know the bats of, of, of 10 year olds you know um but i think that's the, that's the thing is i think it's knowing the cast and it's knowing it's having the experience of of how our spirits work in these different types of casts we are always learning um right. but the, maybe the experiments are, are relatively small compared to the, the the bigger picture like we know what works we know what, what we, we want to keep doing okay so i, I mean so the, you know the experimentation done over the last 20 years already now right is has given you a good feel of kind of what what works what yeah. doesn't as you yeah. whereas i think i mean the challenge for for jim in those early years uh and for the team then and including yourself when you joined in 2004 was to kind of get a grip on well what does you know what does octomore do in a cask yeah. Yeah. For, as an example now oh, maybe sure. you have those, le those learnings yeah, for sure. And and don't get me wrong, there's still plenty of surprises as well. There's still plenty of things that we, you know, we pick up. I mean, this is the thing that there's so much, so many options out there. Um, you know, we, like Octomore is there's relatively little of it made. And uh, we do um, expression of Octomore, the, the 0 0.4 editions, which are always aged in virgin oak. Right. And on the face of it, that's relatively easy. You just, you know, it's just virgin oak. But then you start thinking about the species of oak, you know, is it American? Is it, um, you know, whereabouts in America was that tree grown? You know, how do you toast that cask? What size is that cask? Right. Um, you know, is it Japanese oak? Is it Colombian oak? You know, is it Siberian oak? Is it Hungarian oak? French oak? You know, which, which species of French oak is it? Um, as I say, the size of the cask, the toasting level, the, the way it's coopered, you end up, and again, then you add that to the vintage of Octomo, you add that to the PPM of the Octomo, and you're creating these, even in just one expression, you've got so much kind of variation. So we're always going to be learning. We're always going to be kind of pushing the boundary. I think, you know, you get more comfortable with that experimental way as you go. You kind of, um, you don't necessarily always know what's going to happen. But, uh, for example, uh, we released um, uh, recently the Octomore 10th edition uh, last year. Yeah. It's relatively recently. And um, of that, we released a 0.4, which was a three-year-old Octomore. Um, and we had filled it into uh, the, the virgin oak casks, um, French oak, um, just a, you know, beautiful cask we got from Cooperage at Segamer. And um, we filled the spirit just to see what happened. And uh, after two years, I remember pulling a sample out of the cask and thinking, Gosh, this, this is this is kind of going to bottle now, you know, and we developed the product. And there you go, at, at literally three years in a day, um, we put it in a bottle and it's to be provocative, it's to be, uh, you know, challenging conceptions about uh, about uh, whiskey, but also it's amazing whiskey. And yet, if you try that with a with American oak, it's not ready yet. Um, right. So the species, everything will create different, different uh, options of whiskey. And I think to me that that's fascinating. That's really exciting. Yeah. That, that, that these experiments are shaped. And again, the, sometimes it's a bit daunting, but the great thing is if you taste something, it's good, it's ready. It goes in a bottle, and we release it. And start a conversation around it. Yeah, uh, it's brilliant. I mean, you know, I think if uh, if the, in in the in the first ten years or so, so you know, two thousand one to uh, two thousand ten, there obviously for, for understandably a lot of different releases, right? Yeah. Just drawing on the on the casks that had been acquired with the distillery, um, and now you know by the sounds of things, I mean, you know, you guys know what your spirit is doing on the you know since the kind of new regime, um, and so far, I mean, I, I know I speak for many South African whiskey lovers. You know who, who who love Octomore, love Port Charlotte, love Brookladdy, and definitely see a a a kind of a house profile, if you will, or a you know a distillery profile for each one. So uh, you know, keep up what you guys are doing. Thank you. We'll keep Thank drinking. <laughs> um, I, uh, I mean, in, in terms of the distillery, right? And and you 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 alluded to this earlier, but uh, you know, in terms of distilleries in Scotland, Brookladdy employ more people than almost any other distillery. Right, your competition is probably, and I say competition, it's not competition. It's a beautiful thing that two distilleries have this reputation, Springbank being the others, the other obvious distillery in Campbelltown. Because a lot of distilleries don't actually require too many hands-on you know, people at the distillery because it's highly automated. Uh, Brooklady have, have very much kind of chosen not to go that route and are known to be a, a you know, powerful local employer 
on 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 island um and that includes in the bottling hall right so you have a bottling hall that requires people the one part of the the process that brook are, are missing so to speak um is the malting floors i i know that there has been kind of you know uh murmurings for a few years that it, it is coming and that brook yeah. you know have the intention of of getting malting floors C can you just update us is there any kind of eta on that or any plans and you know what, what do the plans currently look like for the distillery being able to malt its own barley on site yeah so i mean we, we, yeah as you said there we've been desperate to to kind of put that missing piece of the jigsaw in for many many years and it's always been a I'd love to do it one day one day and and now we're at the stage where yeah we've, we've um kind of committed to do it and we're just kind of working through the designs if you like um alan that he for alan logan um so uh, he's very kind of hands-on with I mean, he, he drives these projects um you know these kind of the construction projects um like anything you know we can only kind of do so much at, at one time uh, we do have a big staff you know, we do a lot here uh, we create a lot of whiskies but also a lot of investment in behind the scenes in terms of fair housing uh so we you know, I say currently we were in the middle of constructing another phase of building uh, six warehouses, each one with a capacity for uh, just over 10,000 casks. Wow. So that's, again, securing kind of a future of the distillery, if you like, on, on the island. Um, so we're working on that. And once we've kind of got that um, complete, you know, which should be later on this year, I mean, again, current situation uh, allowing, uh, of course, we'd like to get those warehouses um, uh, complete. Which will actually allow us to move stock from some of the old warehouses to the distillery, some of the ones that built in the 60s. Um, so, kind of, you know, they, they hold, I think we'd be looking at moving about 15,000 casks, wow. as well as all the other things we do. So, if we move those 15,000 casks across to the uh, warehouse site, which is just uh, next to the distillery, um, we would use the, the kind of footprint, if you like, of those old warehouses to build a molten uh, site on, so it could be on site at the distillery, um, yeah. which, which is obviously very important. I mean, you could look at another uh, greenfield site and maybe you know, put a molten somewhere, but we're gonna use the malt at the distillery and we want to, we want to have everyone you know, in, in the same, you know, the malt guys, we want them to be on the on site as well. With, uh, with the So we haven't kind of broken ground on it yet. We know we've got a plan, we've got to move casks. Um, we're still kind of designing the, uh, the malting, if you like. But, quite clear that we would want to use a method um, of salad in boxes, uh, which is the method employed by beds up in a mess where we, they malt for us at the moment. Um, but I think the big thing about this is it would it would be substantial. You know, Currently, of a, on a million litres of alcohol every year, about 50% of that is with Isla grown barley. So the Isla barley is a, is a huge part. It's a big commitment to, to what we do with Isla or on Isla. We want to, to malt everything here um, and also take in maybe some of the small batches, you know, the bare barley, um, bring them onto the island as well. To, uh, um, so it would be a, a big capacity uh, malting that would be kind of running year round. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, the salad boxes allow us to do that um, and do it on a, a small footprint as well. Uh, we don't want to be kind of taking over half of Isla with malting floors and. Uh, right. um, you know, we're committed to tradition. I think we have to be kind of pragmatic about what we want to do to be able to support the rest of the community and the farmers in the right way. If it was just the small maltings, you know, hand turned, we produce, you know, five percent of what we do. We're looking to right. produce fifty percent, so it'll be quite a quite a big uh, big project. Okay. Um, I, I would just I would think that you know, so there's you know, because the the distillery is very much known for kind of its barley experimentation, as we've already touched on, and, and the idea of terroir, which is very much down to the barley to a large degree. Um, uh, and, and you do have certain farmers and growers in, 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 in non isla areas. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, the intention, I would think, is, is never to actually move across to be, you know, exclusively isla barley. I mean, you may try and increase that component, but the idea is still to, to experiment, let's say, with Orkney beer barley, and, you know, and... and yeah, if you only did Isla barley, it almost maybe to some degree uh, restrict your yeah. ability to experiment. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think so. I think you know, we we you know Isla barley has is, is been a it's a huge part of the story of Brooklady, and it's a huge you know in the community we, we, we want to be looking out for the farmers and producing you know uh, Isla whiskey. Um, even if it doesn't taste any different, I think we still do it because it just feels like the right thing to do. You know, to be supporting right. the community and your friends, your family. Um, and and making if you know with Brooklady whiskey, we want, Isla whiskey, we want as much Isla this if that's a, a term uh, in that whiskey, we want to be as Isla as we can be. 
Um, but there's only so much, I live in a relatively small place, there's only so much barley that can produce um, before it starts to do probably damage to, to the agricultural systems here before uh, we run out of land, you know, there's only so much suitable land for growing as well. Um, so I don't think we would ever be 100% uh, and, and to your point exactly, we miss out on fair barley, we miss out on the different regional experiments we can do. Um, but uh, but it gives us, you know, growing an island gives us lots of possibilities because we'll be able to, um, uh, you know, we actually bought the, the croft. Uh, I'm actually looking out the window uh, at it just now. There's a croft uh, just next to the distillery we, we purchased uh, when it came up for sale. And we use that not just to throw in barley that we'd be able to make a, an Isla Procladi specific uh, whiskey. We're able to use that land for supporting the farmers as a research and development to try and develop varieties of barley that will suit the climate here. On the West Coast on, on the Isla, it's very different to uh, um, you know, the East Coast of Scotland or wherever else you know, barley is, is raised, and we want to find something specific. Most like I was talking about the bear barley being a suit to We want to find varieties of, that kind of express the flavour of Isla and, and the terroir of Isla in its best possible light, you know. Um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of projects on the go. We're going to be busy. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be busy for a long while by the sounds of things. Um, the, there's also, I think, a question, you know, when we talk about terroir and kind of, you know, being about the land and the place, um, I think the one thing that maybe is missing to some degree, which I know is on your radar, is the actual, is, the, is kind of the utilization of Isla Peat. I yeah. know there's been some experimentation with that historically, and if you're looking at doing your floor maltings, I'm assuming that's going to kind of introduce maybe some, some, some Isla Peat, but yeah, in, sure. how are those experiments going? Um, well, it's interesting. Again, like so we, we have tried island peat in the past, um, and uh, you know, it's not that like you can just kind of go and dig a bit of, you know, ground somewhere. But peat, you know, it's all uh, you know, island so, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a, a site of special, sorry, a site of special scientific interest. You know, so that you have to uh, get specific licenses for doing these kind of things. So we have been able to extract some peat. Um, and actually sent that to Inverness to do, you know, Isla specific peat with different uh, batches of whiskey. Um, and with interesting results, you know, some of the whiskey is probably a bit too young to kind of see if it's better or worse. But I think what we see is it's different, you know, and it's just another factor of the terroir, another makeup, you know, depending on what cask you use, you get different flavours. Depending on what peat you use, you get different flavours. Um, I think that's, that's, you know, relatively easy to understand for, for most people. but. Um, I think what, what we'll see is when we start malting, we're able to take control of it in, in a, a better way. Um, when we're malting, um, when we are taking peat from Isla, um, you know, once we've got that, those kind of rights of access, if you like, you know, sorted out for peat extraction. Um, and bearing in mind, it, it won't be much peat at all. I think for our whole um, peated production, you know, the, the malting is about 170 tonnes of peat, which is very, very little in the grand scheme. If you think of I don't know, on the island, I think they use a lot of uh, peat or compost for um, these fast machines, you know, ripping out, you know, thousands of tons of peat over there every, uh, every year. So um, 170 tons is relatively small. I think we'll be able to, uh, to start looking at, uh, you know, being able to extract in a, in a, a nice way, in a, in a small scale way on the island to produce the peat. Yeah. But it will actually give us something interesting, again, in terms of the terroir, where if we're making Isla grown optimal, uh, Isla peat, right. producing optimal, mainland grown barley with mainland gross peat, molten, you effectively have this, the same product, but with these different aspects to it, you get you get different whiskies again, you know, or accentuate that difference even more. So I think it's going to be an interesting, an interesting future for the players. If uh, if things weren't complicated enough, just with your experimentation with barley, I mean, now you know, opening up the peat section, just you yeah. know, I mean, yeah. it's another nth degree, right? Different peat from different parts, cut different ways, uh, you know, peated for different durations, uh, you know. So uh, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I take my head off to you guys. I, it's not an enviable position, I don't think, you know, based on that kind of complexity. Most distiller, distillers choose not to have that level of complexity in their business. So, I mean, yeah. and this is what sets Brook Luddy apart. We know this, and it's, it's wonderful. Uh, so keep doing what you guys are doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we'll keep doing that. I, I think like that it, it's, it's – it's, it's, you look at it, it's as easy as you know if you enjoy something if you're passionate about something it's not it's not difficult you know it, it's it's to us it's going to make life easier it'll make life clearer you know to do these things yeah. and yeah we'll need people to do it you know we'll need uh, more employment but that's, that's not a bad thing they say we're very proud of 
what we do in employing people at the, at the distillery and, uh, and, and doing things here. Uh, right. You know, we don't, we're not going to say we get it right and we're doing everything the best way, but it's the way we believe. And I think that's, that's it's very honest that we do that the way we think it should be done. I, I think, you know, to, to a degree, I mean, it's such a part of the, the DNA of the distillery and, you know, kind of, you know, if you extend that, of the people, right? Um, and, uh, you know, A, I'd love to know kind of who you think, you know, you know who, who originated that kind of culture? Was, was it Jim uh, or was it Duncan? And I want to touch on Duncan briefly, but, uh, you know, it was it Alan, you know, who was it? And then, uh, you know, on that, that's, it, it's also to a point, my other just comment would be that if you're, because it's part of your DNA, if you're not doing it, you're actually not happy with what you're doing because you, know, you, you have such an, an itch to scratch experimenting, trying new things. But where do you think that originally that culture comes from? I think it comes from a few places. I think um, when, you know, you talked about Mark uh, Rainier at the very beginning, I think um, getting into distilling, you know, I think there were Mark and, uh, and Simon, um, who is, you know, still the kind of still involved with the business now, Simon's the, the kind of, um, uh, you know, the, the kind of chairman, if you like, of the, of the distillery. He works with uh, with Westland and, and Domain to Hot Glass, the other two, uh, distilleries that Remy Quantro have in the, the kind of whiskey division. Um, and I, I think Mark and Simon come from the wine background and, you know, coming from that that place where terroir is everything, you know, the, the grape, the variety, you know, where it's grown, how it's grown, the method, producing something specific to a place. When they got interested in the whiskey industry, we were bottling whiskey, they saw that there wasn't that same interest in distilling. And they recognised that there was a need to explore it. And a, and a space to explore it, you know. So they got into Reclady with Jim again. Jim was, uh, I mean, experiment, experimentation is, is you know, it's in his blood, you know, his, uh, his creation. You know, he's, a, he's a creative man. Um, so I think there's elements that everyone kind of brought. Um, the current uh, CEO, Douglas Taylor, uh, he came in about, uh, about 10 years ago into the, the business. And again, I think it's the people, if you, if you have the right mindset, you know, everyone brings something, everyone has a different view, everyone wants to, you know, kind of work towards the, the best thing. And um, actually, I had a call this morning uh, with Alan, with Douglas, with Simon, and with Lynn uh, about some product development stuff and some, some things with the brand uh, in the future. And we all were very, very aligned on the same thing. We all had different takes on that same subject. And we're all you know, talking, and Simon actually said, I think we're all in agreement here. We're all the same. <laughs> <laughs> they were all saying the same thing, you know, in slightly different ways. And I think that's it, that um, we're all bringing something to this, you know, in, in terms of the, the concept, the ideas. Uh, but very much, I, I think, in the in the melting pot is that, um, that kind of 2001 team, you know, the guys who got it together. And the aim was to try new things, to, to be experimental, to, to shake the tree and see what falls out, you know. To, uh, to, I mean, talk about Optimo or Jim. Really wanted to create Optimo just to see what would happen, because no one was doing anything like that. And if we didn't do it, if we didn't create Optimo, nobody else out there would have done. So I think there was, there was that kind of, like say, that curiosity in, in, in the team, um, but the ability uh, to say, uh, you know, we were independent, we could do exactly, what we did. Um, and so we did. And then, of course, now we're owned by Remy Contro, um, and as a family company themselves, they they just absolutely need us to get on with it. And and. Again, we'd we'll be quite happy to say, you know what, you need to put more things in. Great, give us the plan, and there's the cash. So they've been very, very supportive. You know, really, really. Um, really yeah, I mean, I, I remember there being lots of concern when Remy uh, bought the distillery. I think it was in 2012, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and you know, in general, kind of the whiskey community and whiskey fans are like, oh no, everything's going to change. And if, I mean, nothing, nothing changed. You know, and and that's it's a testament to both Remy and Brooke Laddie. I mean, but it's been wonderful to see that there hasn't been a change. Uh, I mean, you could be none the wiser that there's new ownership because the distillery is still cracking along all these experiments, if anything, more experimentation and more more access to funds to be able to do floor maltings and cool things. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, the relationship's been been fantastic. Um, we always like to say that, you know, that they have, you know, the good thing for us as a small company, independent company, was we have the money. <clears throat> and Remy have very deep pockets we have very long arms so uh, <laughs> it works very very well but, uh, but without making light of that too much i mean i think that they're very keen to support and and they see what we're doing in the whiskey industry as new and it's, it's got a new territory and um that, that you know they, they're very comfortable with that and they're very you know they, they believe what we do and they, they, they back us completely which is fantastic um and again we influence you know their company that we they influence our company that's it's been a natural that happens 
Um, but no, they, they, they completely understand that uh, what we do is an evolution, it's a change, it's a growth. And, and you're right, there was a lot of people saying when, when Premi Quantro took us over, Bradley's changed. But is different, you know, the experimentation we had, you know, where you release 30 different whiskies every year. You know, we, before Remy Quantro uh, purchased us, we recognized that that wasn't, you know, that, that was survival, if you like. That was that was just, you know, working with the stocks we had, creating things because the stocks were so patchy from the different shutdowns in the past. Um, but it was, it was kind of creating, it was, it was very exciting, but it was establishing an identity and it was a period of time. And then we were evolving, you know, as we start thinking about, okay, we want to make Isla, uh, you tease it as an example, we want to make Isla uh, whiskey with Isla barley. So we, we started doing that, but until that whiskey is aged, you have to make whiskey in, in other ways, you have to be creative. And Jim was fantastic in some of the amazing expressions he created. But then when the Isla barley came online, okay, we can start thinking about a more structured approach. And instead of maybe mixing Riclady, Pochala, Optimo together to create infinity, which I think is behind me somewhere on the, on the road. Yeah. Um, you know, actually, let's think about Procladi Port Charlotte or a separate single model. So it was the development of thinking all the time um, as we evolved ourselves. And I think a lot of people mistook that timing as Remy Quantro changing anything, where actually that was our own thinking, our own development of, of our own brands as we, as, we, as we create them, you know, I think. So um, they've been very much in the background, very, very, very much. Uh, very supportive as well. Yeah, it's brilliant. Um, Adam, if you don't mind, so I'd, I'd love to get onto some kind of audience questions if you can of course, still yeah. Yeah. in 15 minutes. But but just before I do that, I feel it's kind of, you know, it's, uh, whiskey is all about people. Um, and, uh, you know, from, and and I say this all the time, I'm a firm believer of it myself, you know, the, the people who make it, the history of the people. Um, but sadly, people come and go. Um, and so I, I'd, I'd be doing kind of a, a disservice by, by not mentioning uh, Duncan McGilvery, who sadly passed away just shy of two months ago. Yeah. Um, and so, I, you know, just kind of, you know, on behalf of Whiskey Brother and the SA Whiskey community, just to kind of send condolences to the team and obviously to Duncan's family. We, we don't have access to them, but if you could pass on those regards. Of course, I um, do. Thank you. And then, you know, I think also, so for, depending on, on, on your kind of awareness, you know, some individuals may not know who Duncan was. Um, you know, so... You know, I'd love you to maybe just say kind of a you know a yeah. word or two about him. I mean, I know he was at the distillery from 1974 to about 1994 yeah. before it closed, uh, and when Mark and Jim you know restarted the distillery, they needed a, a man who knew the distillery, and Duncan yeah. was that, was that person. For sure, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I would be happy to talk about Duncan for for many hours. He's uh, <laughs> he's got a huge influence on 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 me over the years, and and a lot of people here. Um, and, and yeah, to give you a bit of context, Duncan had started at the distillery in '74, um, and uh, as a stillman, and he uh, was an engineer uh, and stillman. And uh, over the years, you know, he'd, he'd worked in pretty much every every kind of aspect of, of distillation, and he you know, he was um, the brewer, the kind of the assistant uh, that was closed, I think. And um, so his knowledge of the distillery, you know, was incredible. And his engineering background was, was required, of course, when. It was still re reopened, but that wasn't the first time. You know, when the distillery closed in '94, that wasn't the first time Duncan had been paid off by the distillery. Um, he used to joke that he'd had more comebacks than Frank Sinatra. You know, he would uh, <laughs> each time. You know, that the distillery reopens. You know, we want to get the old team back, and Duncan would come back. So um, when he wasn't working at the distillery, he would be. He had a little garage um, you know, behind uh, behind his house in Port Charlotte, he had a little mechanic shop there. Um, uh, and it's just an amazing mechanic, and um, you know, I remember my dad saying, you know, that he, anytime he had anything wrong with the car, straight to Duncan. I ran the back of the house rather than go to the another garage or anything like that, straight to Duncan. Um, but uh, Duncan, Duncan, so yeah, when, when the distillery opened, um, the team needed someone who the distillery, and, and really someone who, to be honest, there was a group of guys from London, uh, a guy from another distillery, you know, came back to Gladdy. And they wanted to get that old team back together who knew how to run These guys had seen this kind of thing before. They'd seen it open, they'd seen it closed. They want to come back for another another time. So Jim knew that to get these guys back, he needed to get Duncan because everyone trusted Duncan. Right. Um, everyone, you know, Duncan was, was uh, you know, quite a, quite a, hum, a very humble man. Um, shout, he didn't get angry. Great sense of humor. Um, and he worked so hard, you know, so, so hard. I think, you know, he, set this example where 
for me as a as a young guy getting into the distilling and working with them, I, I everything I if Duncan asked me to do something, then I would want to you know come hell or high water I would get it done because Duncan asked me to, um, and you could see the hours he worked and what he put into the resurrection of the distillery, um, you know the, the engineering kind of skills, you know the working with no budgets, you know the, the created a heat exchange system which cost them about, uh, about three bottles of whiskey you know it was just cobbled together from bits and pieces but it just uh, an amazing man and, and, and passionate and you know, it, it, glad he you know through, through blood you know a great family man as well um it's just you know really down to a, a, a lovely guy and it's very very sadly a huge inspiration to, uh, to a lot of us so, yeah. Uh, if everyone has a has a drive at home, I think we should all just raise a little glass to uh, to Duncan. Absolutely, to Duncan. Sandra. Thank, thank you for sharing some words with with us. I mean, you know, the truth is, you know, as a whiskey enthusiast, uh, and if you like Peter whiskey, you know, Isla is the is the mecca, and you always want to get there. And and if you do get there, it doesn't mean you get to meet everyone, right? You depending on you know who's there and who's not, and who's busy yeah. and working. Yeah. So uh, you know, a lot of these names that, that you read about, or you know, you know, you don't often get to meet. Um, and so you know, it's lovely to kind of get a first hand, you know, from from yourself. And, and we appreciate it. Thank you. And we are again, you know, our condolences to kind of the Brook Luddy and the Isla community for 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 Duncan's passing. Well, thank you. Yeah. Well, I'll pass that on to his family for sure. Thank you. Um, so if you uh, moving on to then maybe a slightly more lighter, uh, light hearted uh, note, we'll just take some questions in if you're happy. Um, of course, yeah. Please do fire them in. Yeah. Excellent. So um, there has obviously been kind of some murmurings about, or not murmurings, but on record, uh, Brooklady saying that uh, you've distilled some rye spirit. So just just wondering, there's a question from Gary about, can you share more lights on, on that rye whiskey that you, or not whiskey, yeah, rye whiskey that yeah, you've distilled, yeah, yeah. Um, and what you plan on doing with it? Um, well, it, it's, a, it's a really interesting project. Um, again, in terms of experimentation, um, some of the you know different peating levels we've talked about. We've made different you know, um, triple or quadruple distilled whiskies, and using using rye was a, actually a really interesting kind of way of, of you know scratching that itch about using another grain. You know, could could we, could we experiment with with oats, with rye, with uh, with wheat or something? Um, and so the idea was there, but you know, like anything, we don't want to just do things for for a gimmick. A gimmick you know, we want to have some reasoning behind it. And the rye was born out of of the kind of Isla Bali. Uh, project where the farmers here are quite restricted in what they, they can grow, one for the climate, but also the growing barley is, is okay because we're going to take it from them and we'll pay a higher price for the logistics here, we understand it, we're okay with it. Um, but for example, if the, you know to grow barley, you use a rotation system, so you grow different crops. The island farmers are quite limited because if they were to, um, I always use the example of, of be growing a root crop, if they grew carrots one year, their rotation uh, to help the, the kind of diversity of the soil, uh, amongst other things. If they grew carrots on either, and then they harvested those carrots, and then they shipped them across to, to wherever on the mainland to, to sell them, they would be the most expensive carrots in Scotland because right. of the logistics involved. So they, they, there's no point in even trying, you know? So they're right. very limited in, in, in the rotation they, they can do. Um, and, you know, again, we, we've kind of created this, this project where there's um, 20 farmers growing for us. And rye is an interesting crop because it will work in rotation with barley, it will put nutrients back into the soil, it will fix the soil nutrients that the barley will use. Um, and so it became something that, you know, it could be a green crop, it could be like a green manure that can plowed back in, or actually, hey, well, let's try and distill it. Um, so we, we worked with uh, with a guy, Andrew Jones, uh, up a cool farm in the west coast of, uh, of the island. And he provided us with, you know, he grew a field of rye. Um, to see if he could grow it, to see if it worked in the soil. He managed to get about 12 tonnes, I think, um, back in 2017. Uh, so very, very small amount, um, but we were, we had it um, tried. We couldn't get it malted. Uh, we thought we'd try it without. Um, so we blended some uh, some isla grown rye and some isla grown uh, malted barley together. Um, the mash bill was about 55% rye, 45% uh, malted barley. We distilled that in December uh, 2017. Um, in terms of kind of mashing, it was an absolute nightmare. Um, a real learning curve to be able to work with a different grain like that. Very, very different to barley. Um, but we did manage to get uh, casks filled. We did manage to get some spirit from that. Um, we filled it into, <clears throat> excuse me, a variety of different types of casks. So virgin oak casks, some ex barrels. Um, so we've got like six different cask types. 
uh, maturing uh, and watching that. So at the moment, it's just very experimental. We're watching it grow, uh, watching it develop. Um, it is it is an amazing spirit. I, I think it's an absolutely delicious spirit. But in terms of planned, don't know at the moment. Is the the easy the easy answer to that one? Uh, yeah. But yeah, it is too soon. I think you know it, it's, it's it's research and development. It's trials, and I think I think we'll bottle some at some point. You know, probably you know for three years this year. We, be looking at something maybe between five and eight years, something like that, and uh, depending on how it develops. Uh, okay. I, I don't make any promises, you know, but it's a really interesting thing to do. Uh, we made a little bit more last year in December last year, and uh, we plan to make a bit more each year again. So um, it's, it's the start of something really interesting, but um, I, I think it's an amazing spirit. Again, the Tamar aspect of it is it's really interesting, the concept of it is really interesting, um, and it's a good whiskey. So Right. Well, yeah. What's this? What's the space? Look forward to exactly. seeing what, what yeah. that uh, you know results in. Uh, there's a question from Derek uh, saying, according to literature and discussions with others, warehousing has an influence on the cask aromatics infusion into the spirit. Is there a discernible difference between Lochendal and Brooklady warehouses on the same spirit, obviously using the same cask type slash slash batch? Yeah, and it's interesting. I, I probably haven't done any kind of experimentation, you know, in terms of the same spirit of the same cask, you know, the same kind of distillation, same um, uh, cask types in, in two different locations because we, we tend not to to kind of split that up. You know, we would just kind of we wouldn't really get to that kind of place. So um, easy answer to that one is I haven't got that level of, okay. of, of detail on, on those specifics um, in, in that way, but. Um, it, it does make a difference. I think you know we, we find different um, different kind of rates of maturation, different uh, different profiles depending on where we mature, how we mature. Um, I, I think the big thing is that we 100% committed to maturing everything on on the island um, because again it's it's the island. I mean it does make a, a vast difference in terms of the the um, flavour in the whiskey. It, it does make a difference. We it will pick up flavours from that. Um, the only problem is, Jim, um, someone was talking about with, um, sure, or take two casks, like, like say, the same spirit, the same cast types, but we make that more island, see what happens. But we want to mature 100% on the island, so we, we, we don't want to find out the answer to that. You know, we don't want to even put one cask off the island. You know? Right. Um, okay. So, yeah. All right, great. Thank you. Um, so, you know, am, am I correct in understanding that all Port Charlotte's that is bottled is matured at the old Port Charlotte warehouses in Port Charlotte. That's correct, right? No, initially that was the intention that we would do that. Okay. But um, the, the Port Charlotte warehouses, um, the beautiful warehouses from the Lock and Doll Distillery, um, they um, they're quite small to be honest. So we, we wouldn't be able to store everything in there. Okay. Um, and actually, the, the, the very old, the, the um, traditional kind of dunnage racking, so very useful for storing um, butts. You know, kind of unusual size casks uh, rather than storing it in racking where we would have at the distillery. So um, it's more about the, the type of cask and uh, kind of things in Charlotte. Although back in 2001, that was that was the idea that we were much more sure Charlotte, more Charlotte warehouse. Right. I, I mean, there was there was uh, in the early days there was also kind of you know rumors or murmurings, and then I think Jim was you know quite happy to say that he would he'd love the idea of getting that old distillery you know kind of rebuilt as well. Mm -hmm. um, is there is there any um, you know there, is is that anything that's potentially in the pipeline? Is it something that you would love to see happen as well? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, it's, 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 we actually did. You know, when you talk about that, uh, Jim, um, I think it was two thousand. It was two thousand seven. We actually cut the first turf uh, for the the you know starting of the, of the building of Port Charlotte uh, where, uh, Distillery um, or whatever it would have been called. Um, so, um, Sir John McTaggart, who was the chairman of the of Company at the time he um, he cut the, or his wife I think cut the very first turf and also the last turf uh, <laughs> for that distillery. Um, so, I mean, we, so we did have plans. We had plans drawn up. We, you know, uh, still on a drawer somewhere in the back office. Um, we, we had planned to build a distillery there, but um, of course, you know, 2007. Uh, then of course you had the financial crisis. 2008 hit, and and finances weren't there to bring that project. Right. And actually, um, I think you know it's probably. A, right thing because we have still you know, this kind of uh, 13 years later we still have um a lot of projects at brooklady right you kind know, of foresee before we would even and capacity to distill at the distillery as well but we would need to uh or think about another distillery. um 
Uh, personally, it would have, I think it would have been a fantastic thing. Um, it would have been a really, really interesting thing to, to get yeah. going. Uh, well, maybe it's time, right? You guys need to stop keeping yourselves so busy and just uh, free up some time. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I, I mean, to be honest, I mean, who knows? And uh, you never say never. One day, whether it's Port Charlotte or another location or another thing, if, if we get to the stage where um, we feel that expansion is the right thing to do, I don't think we'd want to kind of remodel Brooklady and, and change things to increase capacity. I think we need to look at something new, something interesting right. elsewhere. So. Um, I'll probably get myself in trouble for answering that way, but I, I, I think uh, who knows? I'd love to be part of another distillery. You know, it'd be great. It's, it's, it's vague enough. You can you can you can make an excuse and be fine. Good. And it's just and the other thing is this is just you and me, Mark, isn't it? There's no one watching. Oh yeah, yeah, no one's watching. It's just okay. Good, good. <laughs> um, next question is from Gary, which is: uh, Will we see the Laddie Ten Year Old Limited Editions continue? Um, I mean, two two releases of the 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 Ten Year Old Brock Laddie. So. Mm -hmm. Will we see a third edition in time? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, yeah, I think so. It was Gary who, who asked that question. Yeah, I think we probably will. I think, um, you know, the, the stocks are, are interesting. There's lots of variances in there from before. But um, the 10 year old is an interesting one. It's quite nice to, to compare against the classic and to look at uh, different expressions and still, you know, experimenting, kind of finding our feet. And if we, if we felt that, um, you know, it's the right whiskey to release at any point, then yeah, we could. Um, as uh, a limited edition or, or something um, yeah absolutely great thank you uh there's a, there's a quick few questions maybe we'll just do another two or three uh they're all fairly quick if you don't mind no, um, you know, what, what's your favorite snack to have when enjoying a dram at home that's from robert uh it's a good question but to be honest uh, i'm being scottish it's it's either whiskey or food it's, it's never <laughs> never the, the two together so uh, i i tend to uh, to uh, probably the closest to food would be an ice cube be, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we won't tell anyone okay, uh, okay. Uh, next question from Hardy uh, are we going to see more brilliant specials like the Port Charlotte MRC 01 uh, yeah well actually do you know what? I can uh, I can do a little uh, kind of not exclusive really for you but we're going to do uh, a little release for the for the festival of course you know the festival is going to cancel on the island this year so we're, we're looking at doing a kind of a digital version um, so maybe some people in the in the chat will have uh, will have uh, got an email from there. From there. as well. Yeah. 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 So we we've going to release. Uh, we, we just we, we bottled a, a Port Charlotte uh, sixteen year old um, as a as a I mean, spirit. It's just beautiful. We you know, we just I just we had to get that bottle, get that, let people taste it, an older Port Charlotte sixteen. So we had that bottled uh, before the obviously the shutdown, and we'll kind of in a roundabout way release that as a as a kind of festival. Um, say page 2020 anywhere in the portal it's kind of um the festival release this year so yeah again like that when is it when is a special when there's something that is just whiskey is just absolutely singing it needs to go in a bottle yeah we'll put that in a bottle and get that out. so there's Brilliant. plenty of plenty of things what's, up the sleeve yeah what's the cost composition of that uh, of that 16 limited release uh, it's a good question. There's, there's a, off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly, so I don't want to get it, get it wrong. But uh, it's a strong, a strong amount of um, a first fill bourbon casks in there, okay. uh, which uh, a number is, of bottles. The number of bottles. Uh, I think it's about three thousand. I probably got that wrong as well, but uh, I probably shouldn't have said anything. You know, but I don't know the facts. But right. um, so, so just for, for for individuals watching that are maybe confused. Uh, so just kind of, so Fajil, which is the you know Isla Festival of Malta Music. Um, which is usually a week-long festivity, has been cancelled for obvious reason. Um, usually there's obviously every distillery has an open day and they bottle something exclusively for that day that people visiting can get. Um, Brooklady's for Gilles is cancelled. You you guys are doing a digital online kind of yeah. festival on the 24th yeah. of May, so I think that's worth a punt. Um, you know, 24th of May, mark it in the calendars, guys go online, you know, find Brooklady website, it's all there. Um, but then it... it in preparation and plans for that digital day, uh, you guys have bottled this Port Charlotte 16 year old, which is very exciting stuff. As you say, it was never intended for Vigil, but it's bottled and ready to go. So why yeah. not? Yeah. Well, that's it. You know, I, I think we, we, we certainly felt, you know, the festival is such a huge, huge part of, of the kind of identity of Rafali. You know, I think mean, the very first spirit that ever ran when the distillery reopened was on the first, the first festival day. You know, it's, it's kind of, it's, you know, it's, it's the biggest day of the year for us, you know. So, um, yeah, we, we felt that we couldn't do it physically this year, but we, we couldn't just let the occasion pass without doing something else. So, so it's actually going to be really interesting because it'll be more inclusive for people who can't get to Isla. You know, it'll be uh, a really interesting way of doing things. 
I, I hope that maybe going forward, you, you can do both. You can have, you know, the physical activities for all the individuals that can get there, but then you can still kind of reach a greater audience for the for those who can't get there. So, yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's been interesting what the, what the, the kind of the, you know, the, what do they say about the mother of all invention, right? But, you know, this, this idea that uh, at the moment, you know, obviously, you know, very kind of restrained as to what business, businesses can do. And then there's this move online, kind of adopting the technology sooner. I hope we keep some of that um, in yeah, time. Sure. Sure, yeah. um, just a, so I, I would never ask this question because I'm too polite. Um, but there's a question here from Emil asking about, uh, there seems to be a lot of chatter about uh, and a fair amount of interest in a Whiskey Brother bottling for, you know, from Brogladi, either, you know, whatever it may be. Um, I, in terms of you know, Whiskey Brother, we do single cast releases all the time. Uh, I know, you know, Brogladi have the micro provenance. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Single casks for certain re retailers. Just wondering if you could tell my audience. Um, yeah, no, so, I mean, it's a very, I mean, yeah, I, I'll, what I tend to do every year is, uh, is, is kind of select, um, uh, you know, a, a few casks that will, will you know, um, bottle as, as independent <laughs> or individual casks for, for retailers. Um, it is, uh, it's it's down to the kind of the, the I think Len and her kind of malts team as to who gets them and who doesn't. So you'll have to, you have to speak to her nicely, but I'll definitely put a good word in for you, Mark. Please, yeah, please, please bubble our name up on that waiting list. Um, sure, yeah, I'm absolutely. Sure. Well, I think that's the thing. I mean, it, it, there's, there's um, you know, we, we want to do that kind of thing. We want to kind of create things that are special and unique for people um, supporting us and, and, you know, helping us, you know, do what we do and tell people about it and, you know, I think that you know what you're doing is fantastic. You know, so uh, I'll definitely put a good. Thank you. I know it's also just kind of a, I guess, a shout out to Caitlin Hill. Caitlin Hill, for those who don't know who are watching, um, she is the uh, Brogladi brand ambassador for South Africa, and I've actually I have been in Kate, in discussions with Caitlin to try and kind of get Thanks. our name on the micro provenance list. Appreciate you know there's only several kind of allocated per year, so you know, but you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully our name will, will get there. I'll, I'll put a bit of weight behind it as well. We'll see what we can do, but uh, yeah, that's it. We'll, Hello, Caitlin, as well. Nice to, nice to have you yeah, on. Yes. Um, uh, last question. Uh, uh, this is from Kevin Fraser. He's asking, do you find that barley from some farms give better whiskey than others? And do you find that some farms give barley that is suited for different styles more than others? Nice question. Um, it's a really good question. Yeah, I, I wouldn't use the word better. I think different is the, is the word. And again, I was kind of talking about before with our we refer to as the regional trials, you know, to give you a bit of detail on that. Uh, we take, uh, we speak to um, uh, what's well, four farmers really, you know, three on the mainland and select other farmers as well. We will get them to grow the same variety of barley on the on their fields so that, and again, we'll, we'll get it malted um, and kind of separately so there's no crossover or mixing with anything else, but there's still a completely kind of separate same way the same process so that we end up with um, kind of whiskies four whiskies you know one from each corner of scotland you know north south east west and um and the only difference in, in those whiskies really is is where is the soil because it's the location of uh, and um what we find is that there are real differences so for the last few years we've been going concerto barley across the locations um, and we've been able to, to you know, you can taste this line and you know which one is which just fine. Wow. Uh, and I wouldn't say either of any of them were, were better than the others. Maybe different right. profiles individually prefer or not. But the big thing for us is that there's a difference. Right. Um, and, and uh, do you know, there's, there's a few things I need to touch on the point there about uh, which varieties we use for different. Um, bear barley, you know, having used that and made that for just for clarity, so it's, um, that's something that I I'd be quite tempted you know, in a way because of the, the, the viscosity, because of the texture and the profile we get from the bear barley to see what that would be like with the peated whiskey. Right. But I don't think we'll ever do it. Certainly not, not in the near future because the, the elegance and the delicate flavors that come through in that spirit when you add the peat, you you probably lose something. And I think that you know, really expressing the flavor of the soil of the place and the variety is really special about it. So, Procladi is, is where, you know, it's such a good vehicle, like the barley experiments where there is no peat. 
cloud anything it is just the barley and the farm we're, we're expressing so, uh, it's, it's a fascinating area of uh, still a really zero in on it I think as, as time goes on, we'll be able to release these things, you know, um, kind of small batches, you know, experiment. Maybe it's a three pack, or four pack of different farms, you know, same variety, same vintage, same casks, and then right. just to see what what flavors come from the spirits. So. It's, yeah, I, I mean, I just uh, it's 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 phenomenal what you know what you guys as a team are doing. Uh, you know, I, I wish as a kind of a consumer, I had you know I had the opportunity just to try a little bit of everything. You know, obviously not everything makes makes it to market and as a consumer you can't afford everything but uh, you know just uh, you know what must be in your head about what works with what would and, and you know like it must just be incredible um one of our viewers sebastian and, and again i'm too polite to say this but sebastian <laughs> says well just to note that whiskey brother won the single outlet retailer of the year at the world whiskey awards for 2020 so if we can't get a micro providence i don't know who should <laughs> you're right you're right listen I, I will be putting in a good word i will be putting in a good word. you guys are right so um, um I'll, I'll select something good and if it comes your way then uh yeah, you guys had it here first i'll be very we'll be very happy we're big fans on this side so uh you know it's uh yeah um adam just before i let you go i know so jim McEwen kind of and we, and we didn't even touch on jim which no. is fine we, we, we've got you on, on on video today um obviously but jim is uh, again another another just you know legend in the industry um yeah. and i know when jim was at, at brooklady he was very much kind of the master distiller and when you stepped in, you assumed the title of head distiller, and you know you, you, you're on record saying, "Well, you know, when someone else decides, I'm time for you know, I'm, I'm due for a title upgrade. That's up to them." For now, you're obviously you know you're doing an exceptional job, but in your mind, you're still learning. You're still kind of you know you're you're in the kind of heyday of your career, so to speak. Yeah, but absolutely. In 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 2012, I, you you took me around the distillery for my first tour at, at Brooklady. And uh, I don't know, you know, I don't expect you to remember this. You see thousands of people every week, but uh, I got you to sign a bottle, and I don't know if this is legible, but it says to Mark, uh, I think best wishes, future master distiller. <laughs> <laughs> so, we must have had a few drams then, if you got me to write that we, in the bottle, did you? We, we may have had a few whiskeys together, yeah. yes. But yeah. uh, so it's just I found this quite ironic, right? Because even today, now you're a head distiller, but you're still not master distiller. So to to the future as master distiller um thank you very much for joining us uh I, we i you're you know what you guys do you and the team is is incredible it's fascinating i know i could i could speak to you for hours but i really appreciate the time you've taken and i, I yeah to you and your family and the team stay safe and uh and, and thank you for the incredible whiskey you you make and we look forward to having you in south africa at our show uh when the time is right yeah. Yeah. listen well thank you very much for, for having us well it's really really kind and for you know so many people sticking around to listen to what uh, what we've got to say and, and for drinking and enjoying the whiskey i mean that's that's what it's all about so uh, thank you very much as well yeah. well Sanjeev, thank you adam take care and we'll, we'll see you soon hopefully yes all right take Cheers. care everybody bye. we'll see you on the other side bye. bye okay uh that was absolutely such good fun um what an incredible person and and what an incredible distillery and team um, you know these what what as a whiskey enthusiast you have to take your hat off what 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 they're doing, what they're experimenting with, what they're willing to do, and what they're willing to try, even if it doesn't result in kind of you know a, a viable product, is uh, is just so admirable. Um, I'm gonna I'm very cognizant of the time. Uh, what I don't want to do is have our longest episode ever. Every every kind of week, I think okay, I'll be more on point. But then I have kind of this fortunate opportunity to speak to these incredible people, and uh, I can't but help just you know take my time and and give them the time to, to, to really delve in and give us good answers. So um, what I will just briefly do is just um, have a look through the, the questions just to see if there's anything else that I can answer. I apologize if I didn't get to um, your question, if you had something for Adam. Um, but I'm just going to kind of give a quick look and see if I can uh, um, maybe answer on his behalf. If, he, if he's still watching, he can comment and tell me I'm wrong. Uh, there's a question from Derek saying, how or who makes the call on how much or what percentage of production is petered versus not. Uh, Derek, I think here is very much around, to some degree, market demand. Uh, you'll have heard Adam say that historically, when they started producing Port Charlotte, um, there wasn't as much Port Charlotte being produced as there is today. So the proportions today, about 40% of the production is Port Charlotte, 10% is optimal. So 50%, half of their production is petered. Uh, the other half is unpetered, standard Brook Lady spirit. Um, I would think that, you know, just the, the truth is, Although 
they're very experimental. If Port Charlotte is in very high demand and selling out much faster than Brocklady, you might find that you know they, they slowly increase that percentage. <clears throat> uh, question from Gavin: uh, Is there anything new on the horizon for Port Charlotte limited editions? Uh, Gavin, I think we actually we we did touch on that. Uh, answered via another question. There's the new Port Charlotte 16, which is available only via ballot. Unfortunately, no retailer in the world, even if they're the best, will get stuck. Uh, it is in lieu of the Fajil release, so only available uh, via the distillery. Um, but as you heard Adam, Adam say, they'll always keep experimenting. They've got plenty of different things happening with casks. Um, and uh, when the time's right, some of that will come to market. There's a question from Robert. Does Brookladdy have any feedback or interaction with the with team at Waterford? Um, so Waterford, for those who are not aware, Mark Rainier's new Irish distillery, uh, also very experimental, you know, driven by kind of Mark's, I guess, ethos of terroir and barley, et cetera, and location. Um, and sorry, Robert, actually, uh, I can't answer that. Uh, I, I'll, I will reach out to Brookladdy. Just let's find out if, if they have any interaction with Waterford. And if so, we'll, we'll address it in the future episode. <clears throat> um, question from Mitch, how, is, how has technology changed or influenced the way you make spirits slash peat? I think this I can answer because Brook Lady are notorious for not having adopted much technology at the distillery. Um, I mean, the distillery very much referred to as a Victorian distillery based on the fact it was found in 1881. Um, and they have kept as much of the historical equipment they can. When Jim and Mark and Simon uh, and Duncan first kind of got involved in 2000, 2001, uh, there, was also, there wasn't any finances to just pull out equipment and put in new things, even if it was old. And so they're, they're very well known for still having the same mash tun. It's literally the original 1881 mash tun uh, to mash their barley, uh, mash their malt. Uh, they have had, had, you know, the, it has failed in one or two aspects and they've had to do some repairs but it is still one of the few open top mash tuns in Scotland. If I'm correct, there's only three being used and that's one of them. So uh, they haven't adopted much technology. If you walk through the distillery, there are still chalkboards, still pen and paper. Um, you know, my question even to, to Adam about inventory control and keeping track of all their experiments. Um, and he, he referred to his notebook and his pen. So I think that very much tells us that uh, they've been intentionally, I don't wanna say, unwilling, but not particularly interested in adopting technology, keeping it authentic, keeping it kind of traditional. Uh, question from Gary, are you going to do any experiments with a gin, like some barrel aged gin? Uh, that I also can't answer. What I will say, um, I was very fortunate enough to to be at, uh, to have toured this, to have toured Brook Lady, And on one of my tours uh, with Jim, he actually pulled out a botanist gin from a cask. I don't know if this is meant to be public record, but it was several years ago. So let's assume the statutes of limitation is, is, is passed. Um, and uh, it was gin that had been matured in a, in a ex wine, a chateau something in true Brooklady style. It actually had a pink hue. Uh, if we look at kind of what's been released there, there haven't been any other releases, but I, I think uh, I think the team would be hard pressed not to just because they're so experimental. Uh, Gary, I appreciate that's just my, my two cents, not really a, a you know, proper industry answer. Uh, how are the Fajil bottles going to be sold this year, given the digital environment? That's from Grant. Uh, Grant, I think you, that's also been answered. Um, oh, no, uh, that's actually a very quick question. So I don't know if there's going to be a Fajil release. In lieu of the Fajil release, there's the Port Charlotte 16, which we touched on. Um, I guess we'll have to wait to see. There's been no official announcement from the distillery. If they plan Fajil release, will then be rolled over to uh, a, a you know, later release in the year. Uh, I'm going to just do two more questions, very cognizant of time. Uh, not for my sake, happy to be here the whole evening, but just for the viewers and kind of wanting to maybe get on with your public holiday. Uh, what goes into deciding whether whiskey will be a single cask as opposed to exposing the whiskey to a number of cask types? Is it, a, is it played by nose? That's from Dylan. So it will be a single cask. I think the, here, and if I'm not mistaken, I think also Rachel last week mentioned this. So, you know, the truth is these distilleries have sometimes hundreds of thousands of casks in their warehouses. And there often is just a, a cast, let's say one out of every 50 or out of 100, that's just slightly more unique in its, in its offering. Whether it is a particular note that comes through that is not traditionally found on the spirit, um, or a, maybe a note that is found, but there's just beautifully accentuated. Uh, that's often how the single casts are selected. In, in terms of, a, you know, if you have a cast that's matured and then it's just average, you know, and again, that's no offense to, to anyone, it happens. 
you have 100 casks, not all of them are going to you know, be absolutely nuanced and, and, and offer something exceptional. A lot of them will just be good, and, and there's nothing wrong with, with, with good. Uh, those will then be vatted together. Um, whereas if you have something that's offering something really unique, you actually want to capture it, and that is would often then be selected as a single cask. Um, I think the question from Dylan also touches maybe on finishing. So when do you, uh, you know, as opposed to exposing the whiskey to a number of cask types, um, you know, so for some of the distilleries, that's part of their almost their their standard releases. And I, Glimmerangi are an obvious example. Uh, the La Santa, uh, the Quinta Ruban, um, the, the Nectar d'Or, these have to be finished. But, you know, they, they do have to um, if they want to be released as as that expression in the range and so the distillery are going to choose a cast that's doing well has all the right kind of uh, characteristics to then be re-racked which is emptied and refilled into a let's say sauternes cask um, um, in some instances though there is there is absolutely no doubt that if a cask maybe is not shining through it's not taken on the on the flavor it needs to or that the distillery would expect that it would then be re-racked into something else to just give it an additional layer of flavor or complexity uh, and then last question, and I think actually that brings us to the end. Did you mention number of stills and washback? And that's Keith from Durban. Keith, thank you for the question. Uh, in terms of Brook Luddy, they have two pairs of stills, so two wash and two spirit. Um, they are actually known, and I, I wanted to ask this, but it, I think also Adam's too, too polite to maybe uh, engage, but the the spirit stills at Brook Luddy, from um, my understanding, are actually six meters tall. Uh, and there is another distillery that is very much all around the tallest stills in Scotland, and that six meters would make it a taller still than the other distillery. Um, but yeah, the two pairs of stills, that's all they have. Uh, you heard from Adam that in terms of production, they could actually increase their capacity if they ran more regularly. They're only running about five and a half days a week, whereas, I mean, most big distilleries are running seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Um, and so Brooklady could almost increase their capacity by 15% if they chose to operate seven days a week. They're obviously choosing not to, um, but in terms of number of stills, uh, it is uh, four, and they work in pairs. Uh, and in terms of washbacks, um, I believe it's six wooden washbacks, if I'm not mistaken. All right, everyone, thank you very much for watching. I think that that was a very lengthy episode. I appreciate it. We still have plenty of people hanging around, so thank you for your interest. Um, uh, yeah, thank you to Adam. I doubt he's still watching, but thank you very much for for his time and uh, being a great host, answering just plenty of great, interesting questions. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for watching. I, I see plenty of... Um, oh, I actually... So Adam is, still seems to be in the chat, uh, and he mentioned not sure if the OLC will make it to SA. <clears throat> I think he's busy ref speaking to... He's actually referring to individuals in the chat. So at the moment, I'm not sure what the OLC stands for. But uh, just to, you know, plenty of familiar names, and thank you so much. Uh, I saw a few guys ragging me about my uh, my setup behind me. Of course, having guests on, I want to make them feel comfortable and at home. So I bring out my wares for them, make them feel like they're in a safe environment. Uh, I is obvious, and as I've self-confessed, I'm a big Brook Luddy fan uh, of everything they do. So it's quite easy to get a, get a I'm kind of pointing behind me, a few bottles out. Um, I actually, you may have seen my glass turned a bit darker at one stage. Uh, I had a, a pour of the, the black art on the side, uh, and then I uh, have a little bit of uh, optimal comas to, to finish off uh, my afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I really appreciate it. Appreciate the interest. Thank you for the support. Plenty of uh, familiar names in the chat, so thank you guys for watching. It's lovely to see everybody. Uh, stay safe, stay sane, stay, stay well. And um, we will most likely see you next week. We'll drop a newsletter um, and uh, for more with the Whiskey Makes Me Happy Hour. Cheers.